and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Kevin Becerra, and I'm the Artistic Engagement Manager for Arts Emerson. And it is my extreme pleasure to invite you all to this wonderful Q&A today, kind of our day of Claudia Rankin, um, brought to you by Arts Emerson and WLP and the Fresh Sound Foundation. A um, couple housekeeping things. Note the exit nearest you in case of an emergency. Calmly exit the building away from any kind of fire or whatever's happening. Um, <laughs> um, so those exits are there and there. Uh, just so you all know, this is being live streamed on HowlRound TV. HowlRound is part of the Office of the Arts here at Emerson College. Um, you'll be able to find it on HowlRound's blog after the event is over. And also, uh, don't miss at six o'clock, Claudia will be doing a reading and it should be quite lovely. So now I'm so happy to welcome Kimberly McLaren of WLP and poet and esteemed author, Claudia Rankin. because my colleague Wendy Walters will do a much uh, more extensive introduction at the reading tonight, which I hope you all will attend. Um, it's going to be an extraordinary evening. I am going to um, just give a few, few of uh, uh, Ms. Rankin's accolades. Um, I want to start, however, by thanking um, David Bauer, Arts Emerson, Office of the Arts, Kevin, um, and, um, and, and I want to say honestly, I was thinking about this walking over here. Um, and I looked at the Arts Emerson, o Office of the Arts, excuse me, website, um, in which their mission statement says, we see our work in service of the college, the public, and the arts, prioritizing community engagement with our Boston neighbors, national dialogue, shared field-wide learning, and curricular engagement that connects students with our work. Every, we operate from the assumption that the arts belong to everyone. And I just wanted to say that um, that is often a statement that is made at the elite institutions in Boston but not often a, a statement that is followed through. And Office of the Arts, Arts Emerson, is actually doing that this year, and I'm proud of that, and I want to thank them for doing that. And this, this event is just one opportunity, but they are going into the communities um, in ways that um, many of us who have tried to get some of these elite institutions to do in the past have not been <laughs> willing to do. So just wanted to say that. Um, uh, yes. So uh, I want to thank our chair, Maria Kundora, and our dean, who I don't know if he's here, but just wanted to thank him. He is. Thank you, dean, <laughs> wherever you are, all right, um, of the School of the Arts. Uh, Claudia Rankin is the author of five collections of poetry. Um, the first one is Nothing in Nature is Private, 1995, The End of the Alphabet, 1998, Don't Let Me Be Lonely, an American Lyric in 2004, Plot, uh, uh, in 2001, uh, more than and Citizen, an American, that's five, Citizen, an American Lyric, Grey Wolf Press, 2014, um, which is this extraordinary volume right here, which we'll talk about. She has edited numerous anthologies and produced a number of videos in collaboration with John Lucas, including Situation One. Her book, Don't Let Me Be Lonely, an American Lyric, an experimental multi-genre project that blends poetry, essays, and images. Of this book, poet Robert Creeley said, 
Claudia Rankin here manages an extraordinary melding of means to effect the most articulate and moving testament to the bleak times we live in I have yet seen. It is a masterwork in every sense and altogether her own. She has numerous honors and fellowships, which I'm sure Wendy will document later on, including uh, uh, fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. She is currently the Henry G. Lee Professor of English at Pomona College. Um, and, in 19, and in 2013, she was elected a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. Mark Doty has praised her selection, saying, Claudia Rankin's formerly inventive poems investigate many kinds of boundaries, the unsettled territory between poetry and prose, which this book does beautifully, between the word and the visual image, between what it's like to be a subject and the ways we're defined from outside by skin color, economics, and global corporate culture. This fearless poet extends American poetry, poetry in invigorating new directions. It is our honor and our thrill to welcome here for this conversation, Claudia Rankin. So uh, we're going to get started. Uh, as usual in these conversations, and especially in this one, the challenge is going to be to shut me up in time so that you have a chance to uh, have questions. This is a Q&A. I'm going to spend the first, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes in conversation um, with the poet, um, but I want to make sure, so please, you know, check me, because I will, you know, we can talk all day, um, so that we have opportunity for you guys to engage in the dialogue. This is an extraordinary opportunity for students, especially, to engage in a poet working at the, the top of her form, in, uh, and so I want to leave time for that. Um, I want to start, I want to talk, there's so much to talk about, um, also, um, Claudia, if I may. Um, I want to talk about the book. Um, I want to talk about the role of the artist in times like these. This is really pertinent today. I want to talk about the personal and the political, um, balancing and merging those things. Um, I want to talk about how you use other genres, like playwriting, to inform your poetry and vice versa. This would be pertinent to the students. Um, and how you use uh, art and collage and, and, and painting in this. All of this. I want to talk about what's happening in Baltimore right now. And I want to talk about what happened on Emerson campus yesterday. I want to talk about motherhood and being an artist. Um, and um, I want to talk about James Baldwin, because I always want to talk about James Baldwin, and because you referenced James Baldwin in here. Um, so let, let's start with the book. And I think um, I, it's, per, it's, it's appropriate that we have the, the, the cover, the beautiful cover up here. Um, and I know there's another connection because I'm sure you're aware today is actually the anniversary of the riots in Los Angeles after the Rodney King beating and after the police were acquitted. So, I mean, the, the timing, and this, I want you to talk, if, I, if you would talk about the cover and the image and the connection there and, you know, what, what you make of all that connection. Maybe you can start there. Okay. Um, the image is by the amazing conceptual artist David Hallie. It was done in 1983 um, af after the beating of Rodney King. And um, so many people have thought that it was done in response to Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's yet another example of the continuance of this kind of thing ingrained inside the culture and and the sort of mobility of whiteness to move away from it when it wants to and back into it when it wants to. Um, whereas the rest of us are sort of in a queue line, you know, from Emmett to up. So, um, so yeah, so it's a 1993 um, image. Hammond, I don't know, do you guys know David Hammond at all? He, um, he's done things like soul, um, snowballs on the side of the road, so that you can have the melting whiteness in your hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's um, made bejeweled um, basketball hoops that sit inside of buildings in Soho as chandeliers. So he's, he's a master at going inside the culture and taking the object and marrying it to its political ramifications. I, and I wondered about the, you mentioned the, um, the 
and the melting whiteness in your hands, which is very interesting. And the, the white background here, um, and I don't know if that was intentional on his part, your part, the connection with one of the one of the themes that recurs in the book is the quote from Zora Neale Hurston, right, about, I feel myself, what is the exact quote? I, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. The hoodie, when you see the hoodie, the, it's just, it actually is the hoodie. The piece of art is the actual object, and it was being mounted on the wall. Okay. So the decision to have the white background um, was our decision, our decision. Um, partly visually, but partly to engage visually the subject. What, what does that mean to you? I mean, question, but the, the, there's a work in here. Who's the artist who does the, who uses the sword and the and quote? Glenn Liga. Right. Um, in which the quote recurs over and over again until it kind of shades into blurriness. Um, I, I was, I'm interested in that because that quote, of course, is from her, her um, essay, well, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. And the essay is, 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 is multi-layered, right, the, the essay. So I'm curious about why that quote spoke to you. I feel myself in the colors when I am thrown up against a sharp white background when the essay is actually about the times also that she doesn't feel herself to be colored, right? And 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 how do we balance those? I'm, I'm just curious. Well, I wanted the I wanted this book um, to fit in the world as I fit in the world. So sometimes there is mobility. Sometimes one is able to move through. And then you have those moments when and obstruction happens because racism enters. And then you find yourself having to negotiate something you didn't expect. Partly because it's coming out of the mouths of your friends or colleagues or out of a, the quotidian day, you know, mm -hmm. it happens in a restaurant and you're just wanting to pay your bills or something like that. So, so in that sense, it, it, it is about both things. The, opening quote by Chris Marker, if they don't see happiness in the picture, at least they'll see the black, is in reference to the film Sans Soleil. And to see the film, when he says it, there's a, uh, there's a photograph of, I think, two blonde children on a beautiful day. Then later on in the film, he shows the same landscape, but a volcano has erupted and wiped out where those children would have stood. And so that for me became um, a metaphor for what happens when um, institutionalized racism constructs both the black and the white self and also the brown self so that it's, it's coming in and erupting and wiping out whatever stood before. <coughs> including any kind of encounter that had mobility written into it. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's um, powerful. The w one of the words you just used was, uh, because the book, the beginning of the book um, kind of is a, a, I don't want to say litany, but it's a meditation on the, on the everyday acts of racism, right? Mm -hmm. um, Microaggression, which is what our students were discussing just yesterday. Um, and you used the word unexpected, and that was, uh, to me, that was compelling that it was the student, the word that came up with a lot of the students over and over again, unexpected. And I guess what I'm interested in is is um, why it's unexpected. I'm trying not to reveal too much of myself here, but, but my thing is, like, I guess I always <laughs> expect it, quite <laughs> frankly, right? You know, so I'm wondering how that fits into the uh, eruption of self, mm -hmm. the, the unexpectedness of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's both things. I think there's a knowledge and there's mobility. So if I thought that at every step something was going to trip me up, I might think about doing, you know, second, second thoughts about doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, it's not in my conscious mind. Right. And especially not in my conscious mind when I'm inside an institution that has said, come inside this institution. Whether it is this school, or, or, or on a more intimate level, a friendship. Mm -hmm. And so, 
And you're saying, oh, in, in the bounds of this, there will be some sense of trust in public trust that will exist. Some sense of recognition that runs the grid because here I am. And then you then it erupts out. And then that's why it feels unsafe. But of course, we know it's institutional that we have been built out of out of this kind of understanding. Maybe, I, I don't know where Kevin was. He's going to put up some of these images. I wonder if we could put up the image of the, um, the Glenn John, so people who haven't seen it could see it. Um, because that, that moves into one of the, the final, one of the, not the final, but one of the, yeah, I think it is in the first section, the final moment. Um, the man at the cash register wants to know if you think your card will work, one of these microaggressions. But what was, what's compelling is to me, also equally compelling is on the next page, the response of his partner, <coughs> right? I wanted you to talk about that. He says, um, your friend, she says she's not going to accept it. Your friend says, I refuse to carry that, what doesn't belong to her. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm wondering where the middle ground is between carrying it and not carrying it. Or is there? So is there a third? Is there a third way? Or is there is there an alternative? Right. Um, well, I think I think there's always a third way, but I only exist in two ways right now, which is you receive it, you don't recognize. Sometimes you don't even recognize that the thing gets to you until it's in that position, mm -hmm. um, or you recognize it and you give it back immediately. In in the sense of saying, I don't, you know, I don't want this. Why are you doing this to me? Stop right there. I mean, I have a litany of things that I have at the ready. <laughs> um, I learned recently, stop right there. I kind of like that one. Stop right there. Um, because it puts it back on. Yeah, and it, it, it puts it back on right. the person who said it. So it then they have to do it again. Right. Um, and there is a, the immediate understanding that this is not about me, this is about you. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and then the response often is a kind of defensiveness, it's a, or it's this evasive apology, apology, apology. Um, but just don't do it, just don't do it. And, um, or, or that sense that the injury that you received actually you're giving it by being polite and telling people that you don't want to hear the thing you know, about you. <laughs> 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 um, so the question is, who, who is dealing the injury is always interesting to me. How do you advise students who come to you, students must have students who experience these, these microaggressions? What do you, how do you talk to them about how to negotiate them safely? Well, I think the most common thing that happens in my office, let's say, is that phrase, um, it's my, not my job to educate. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to educate. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of that phrase, actually, because I, I feel that it's not about education. It's about everybody understanding how this external structure is structuring their interaction. And without engagement, we're not going to be able to move forward. So, for those of us who are, for, so if, if a student is conscious, that they have a responsibility to, to share, share that consciousness? I think so. I mean, even to the extent of saying, hey, that's not acceptable. Not for me. Does that place an unfair weight on the students of color? No, because I don't think it's good for them to take, to hold that, that shit, let me put it that way, <laughs> in their body, you know? And I think, I think it's actually actively helpful to acknowledge it as something that doesn't work. And if you go around thinking it's not my job to educate, I think that language becomes part of the mechanism of silencing. Mm -hmm. In the same way that, um, the angry black woman became a mechanism of silence. Right? Black women aren't allowed to get angry. The 
because then they're the angry black man. But what happens when you're supposed to be angry? Can't be angry because you're the angry black man. But you know, so I think there are all these these um, categories that are created, and then they actually are are, are mechanisms of silencing. In in the end, in counseling, I mean that's if you're in counseling, you're in counseling. Right? But encounter from the space of saying, I don't want that. Right. So, I don't want that, but then you have to go forward and explain why, or can you just say, I guess that's what I'm saying. I think you don't. You don't. Okay. I think if you give it back, then what you often happens, at least what happens to me, is why are you so rude? Why are you so sensitive? All right, I'm just rude and sensitive. <laughs> you know? right. Okay, so that's that's the part about right when people yeah. say I don't feel like I have to explain why I want to educate. I think that's what people mean. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, because that means that whiteness is now in you. Like I, right. in refusing the injury, have injured whiteness, right? <laughs> right. And whiteness needs me to show up and right. say you're okay Care and caretaking and caretaking. Yeah. yeah, and I don't that I don't need to do. Right. Right. Okay. Good. That's what I was saying. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, um, so maybe that le that's a good segue into the discussion of so you know whatever people you know personal responsibility, but but the the role of the artist, the artist's responsibility, or the the old role of the artist in in times like these or in times in general. You you, you quote James Baldwin, um, and in some interview I read, you talk about how how uh, James Baldwin talked about how artists. Part of the reason he included art in this, I think, is that it helps the art helps writers to speak. Right, so maybe you could talk about that, but also about, you know, he wrote, James Baldwin, of course, wrote eloquently on the, and passionately about the role of the artist, the, the responsibility of the artist in a society, which is to help people, to keep, to make people see what they don't want to see, mm -hmm. most, most devastatingly, and, and, the, and the cost to the artist of fulfilling that role. So I'm just wondering what you think about that. I mean, certainly your work is doing that, but I don't know if that is, you feel like that's your intention, or is this is just the, the outcome of your work? Is that your purpose, or is that just your, what happens? Um, I'm going to answer that, and then I'm going to back up a little bit. I, I, I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like the purpose of my work is to make art. I, 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 to be honest, I really am not, I am engaged and interrogating a condition in the activity of making my work. But I am, I, I am not thinking about any outcome in the making of the work. Mm -hmm. I'm just making the work. Mm -hmm. And after I've made the work, <laughs> if another thing is asked of me, then perhaps I will do that. In another way, but that has nothing to do with making art for me. Um, so where does so where does the work come from? The work comes from interrogation of experience, um, where I think all work comes from. Um, I don't think that this work is any different from from Dostoevsky's work. I'm going to put myself equal to him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect that when this is done, um, it will sit in the world as some kind of pill or some kind of catalog to, to, to knowledge. I really don't. I, I just I just made it, and I will go on and make something else when I have been done. <laughs> is not suggesting that artists operate out of some kind of character, but that out of uh, an allegiance to exactly what you're talking about, to, to a re ultimate responsibility to examining what it means to be human 
right. in this world. But that that, is, that in itself is a political imperative in some way. I mean, that's, I, I, I see your work situating in that regard, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not saying you right. should fulfill some political imperative. He says, uh, to me, the artist's struggle for integrity is a kind of metaphor for the struggle, which is universal for all human beings all over the face of this terrifying globe to get to become human beings, right? That, and that the poet, you, that's you, uh, that the poets, by which I mean all artists, are finally the only people who know the truth about us. Soldiers don't, statesmen don't, priests don't, union leaders don't, only the poets. And that it is the poet's responsibility to tell us the truth about ourselves. I guess I'm wondering what you think about that. Because that's what I see you doing, whether you know that or not. Right? <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's, that's the truth about ourselves. Well, that, you know, I'm glad that. But I, the reason I'm backing up from this is I, I, um, I'm very weary of this, this idea that work done by minorities of any kind fall into this kind of activism world, which then allows the academy segregated out into these categories of political work, protest work. Oh, we hear is the work, and oh, we see it. You know, are the people who are doing the activism. I'm not doing the activism. I'm doing the work. If the work falls over here into the activism, good for the work. But I'm but in some ways, it's the same conundrum that you were talking about, about black women not allowing to get angry, because I have the same standards. I mean, this is what I tell my writing students. I, I preach to my writing students that the role of the artist mm -hmm. is, to, is to explore what it means to be human. So to me, that's not activism. That's the role of the artist. But I can, but the kids, get, I understand what you're saying, is that if you're a black artist and you're writing about race, then you get categorized as a protest writer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost a no-win situation. Right. Well, it is a no. It's a win-win situation because you guys are here, right? <laughs> and because I wrote what I wanted to write. It's a no-win situation if you are going to be judged by the academy who separates out heteronormative text versus right. everybody else, right. and then puts a judgment on one as transcendent and pure, and the other as protest and alternative and political and timely, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So th this is in some ways analogous to the struggles that uh, women novelists have when writing about right, uh, uh, family issues and personal issues, and which is perceived as, so that's a nice little domestic novel, but when, you know, uh, the male novels named Jonathan, for example, write about um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> domestic <laughs> issues. They are writing about great universal issues. Right, but exactly. Yeah, we don't need to go there. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think that, you know, but I, I love that Baldwin quote, and I agree with him that one wants to arrive at a human place, and one is looking to, to see, to enter into the nerve that feels most human, that feels most So it's not that I love the Baldwin quote, but I don't I wish it to be used right. in, in commercial. Fair enough. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I wanted to ask you about the um, the reprintings of the book and the, the addition of the name. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if people are aware of that. Maybe you could talk about that because uh, a friend of mine, I didn't even realize this until a friend of mine who had a first edition pointed out to me right, that um, when it was first the, on page 135, I don't know if we have that here. Um, no, no. But I have a, it, maybe you could just tell people what Well, that initially, when I did this page, I did it for Jordan Russell Davis. He was the, the guy who was playing music in his car, and the other, the, the other guy um, shot him, killed him, and said that he felt threatened. And then he got off. Mm. Then he was retried. But when I wrote the book, he had gotten off. 
so that was the first thing. And so the case that Jordan Russell and the other cases said the justice system, because that was a clear place that the justice system had failed Jordan Russell. But then it was retried. His girlfriend um, ended up saying something like, no, that was not true. He, he did not feel threatened at all. And who knows why she did that? Um, but she did. And, and I believe that was my understanding. But in any case, he was then He was actually had pizza afterwards, right? So, yeah, so then I thought, well, that, so that's not exactly correct. And, and the book sold out before the print sale. So they said, they called and said, you know, the book is released in October, but it's actually sold out. So we're going to have to do another print run. And if there's anything you would like to change at that point, we'll change it. And, and it was bothering me that that moment that was actually not true any longer. Good. So, so I said, I'd like to change those pages. They said, fine. And but I wanted to come up with a structure that would hold the deaths of these men. Um, that I, the deaths that I knew were coming. And so that, and then thinking back to the, the ligon, as Dean wants to call it, the way that he went down the page into abstraction made me um, think of this format for this page. And so it just says, in memory, and then it has the name. So it's in memory, Jordan Russell Daigle, in memory, Eric Gardner, in memory, John Crawford, in memory, Michael Brown. And then right. since then, I just write them in. Mm. So now it says, in memory, Walt Jody Mark Scott, in memory, Freddie Gray. And so now I just go in and I write them. Mm. The facing page that had earlier said the justice system, after um, Michael Brown was killed, um, the policeman, what was his name? Um, Darren Wilson. You might remember he said, I, I, I thought he was a demon. And he looked like Hulk Hogan. And so I was thinking about that. I was thinking, what is going on in his head exactly? And, and so I wrote down on a piece of paper, because white men can't police their imagination, black men are dying. And I thought it was the first line of something. But everything else I wrote seemed to be subsumed into, because white men can't police their imagination, black men are dying. Mm -hmm. And so I got rid of all of the rest of it and just kept that line. And so then I started playing around with it as a haiku. And that ended up on the facing page. And then that's it, that's, that's how the page became named after. a very powerful moment in your life. Jordan. Well, I think this actually might be a good place to um, open it up to uh, audience questions. I'm sure there are plenty of people who would like to engage in conversation with the poet. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand what you were talking about when you said that you didn't want to be, um, that you just are an artist and you create art. But as an artist, are you, how can, and as a human being, how can you not um, reflect what's happening in society? Isn't that what artists do? No, I'm not saying that I don't reflect what's happening in society. I'm saying that I'm not trying to control your response to my work. That I am <coughs> making work. I'm making the work out of the life that I live and the world that I'm in. So you're saying you don't have an ulterior motive? I don't have. I'm not trying to change your mind. Right. 
I am not trying to persuade you. I am not trying to um, get sympathy from anyone. I am just making the things that I perceive. Occupying the community, being a citizen in the city, to be in front of people, the crowds of people who are over there um, in, in, in the city to do the work and make, I am sure, a better living. Thank you. Thank you. And also, this sense that one can segregate politics out from one's mind is <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And, and I guess that's what I was trying to get at. How do you articulate? How do we? I struggle with how to explain that to my students, I guess, exactly that. So maybe, maybe, maybe go ahead. The, the, the idea that they are, in fact, separate and distinct. They, they cannot be. Right. They cannot be because that is what is determining the fact that you are standing here in the It is what is sanctioning a police state that we live in. So this, this construction that which is basically a lie, that it's over there and you're over here. It's crazy. Other questions?
and I was walking down Broadway, and I mean, I just, these thoughts were swirling, and I was very sad. And I walked into a Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. which was probably the 80s. And there was a woman, a white woman, and she was crying. And I said to her, you know, I just, I didn't know her, but I walked in and she was crying. So I said, are you okay? referring to the decision. And that moment I was back in. Mm -hmm. We were back, we were like two citizens. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the problem. When, when whiteness sees these aggressions as not about them, when it is about our public, it is about the w this, it's about what it means to be American. It is about what kind of acceptance we are giving to white supremacy. So when you start feeling like you're appropriating, that's the moment you begin to feel like it's not about you. It is as much an insult to you as it is to them. Or it should be. And it should feel like when it doesn't feel like that, that's when you should ask yourself, what's going on? Why don't I feel this as much as she does? Uh, hi again. I just want to start by saying thank you for being here. It was a pleasure to be in your class yesterday. Um, wondering if you have any suggestions on how to use your text to teach students um, or to raise awareness among students about what's going on now. Um, as an instructor of color, I often find it difficult um, to bring my full self in, ter in terms of current times to the classroom. So I'm wondering how I could shield myself behind your text um, <laughs> while also um, sharing this wonderful piece of work with students who should know about it anyway. So. I'm just wondering if you have suggestions that I can use tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one thing I've, I've done that I find useful um, is I ask students to write down their own microaggressions. Um, and then we talk about them on the level of language. Not in terms of what is right or wrong, but in terms of how it got written where responsibility is taken inside the language and where it is not. What the pronouns are doing. Who gets to be in the position of the object and who gets to be in the position of the subject. And that, that it, to me, has revealed more than discussing the issues. Because then you really begin to understand where that particular body positions itself relative to the world and the things that they're thinking about. I, I, have, I was in a classroom of teachers, like mostly white women who um, had taught in public schools all their life, dedicated their lives to teaching integrity programs. And then I asked them to write down microaggressions. And one woman wrote something like, they often have low expectations for the black child. And she read that. And I, I said, who's they? And she said, well, me. And I said, well, why didn't you say I? <laughs> I have often <laughs> had low expectations for the black child that I teach. And she said, I don't know why I didn't write I. And I said, well, why didn't you read it as I? And she did, but her 
think this turning red has to do with cancer. So even as she recognizes what she did for Doug, there was that grammatical move to move herself or distance herself from what she was knowing and what she was feeling. So if you stay in the language, that did not belong to the reader. And that was deposited in this body. One of the reasons I never put my photo on the back of the book, a discussion with my publisher, <laughs> is to at least prevent that mode of identification and disconnection. Um, and I didn't like that sense of this is a, this is a, and also these stories are not mine. I collected, but talk about community. They came out of conversation with friends and colleagues. And so the I would feel disingenuous in the book. Not that I wouldn't do that if I, <laughs> <laughs> if I did it in Bell and Um But here, there was a sense of when I, use the second person, I realize that if you strip everyone of color so that no one is named as black or white, unless the, the, the telling needed it, but 
if we did that thing where we're all just people here, why don't we do that? Let's just all be people here and strip any um, demarcation from the past. So then if you step into the Yugesh, you're going to have to do that for yourself. And you would have to move around to figure out, is this the collective view? Is this the view in plural? Is this the view politic, you know, specifically? Is it a view intimately? And it's all of that that the you allowed was exciting as a writer in the, on the level of craft. To be able to traverse the territory of the you so that it was always fluid, that you didn't know sort of where it stood exactly from piece to piece and who owned it from piece to piece. And so that, that mobility to, to, to take the pronoun and give it the kind of privilege of mobility was very exciting in the making of these pieces on, on the craft level. The other word I love is fear. And, and I use that in Will I May Be Lonely. Because I love that fear is both the positioning and the giving. You know, that I love <laughs> words that, that, that's like, here is a sexy word. You are standing here and here. I can hand it over to you. Um, so I love words that have in, built in them this kind of, this flex.
Um, it is the Nick Cave remains is an attempt to create an imagination that doesn't live inside of the gaze of the white gaze. He started making these sound suits after the beating of Rodney King. Because he said, if the problem is only the color, the skin color, really, literally the problem is skin color, let's just cover it up. And so from head to foot, you put on these beautiful garments. And it's impossible to know who's inside. And that was that became a moment where the imagination was attempting to leap out of the social construct that it held itself. But you said somewhere at first you thought that was escapism, right? That at first, first you when, worried that that yeah. You at know, first I worried about it, but then I was reading Robin Hood's Freedom Period, a book that I love, mm -hmm. and in the very last. Um, chapter, he talks about this a little bit. He talks about how the only way out will be to make a way. And partly because we are, all of us, constructed out of these institutions of racism. I mean, Ben Affleck saying, I don't want anyone to know that, <laughs> you know, my ancestors were. Is that just a perfect uh, metaphor for America's inability exactly. to deal with? I mean, you couldn't have asked for a more perfect exactly. uh, I, 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 I thought that was just like, what do you, what did you think was the Right, <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> you know, what, what exactly was the, the ultimate scenario that you were talking about? And what is the danger in acknowledging in, that? Exactly. That's the what question. The what, what was the danger to himself in acknowledging right. the truth, exactly. right? And that was so bad that he couldn't right. go near it. I think that's the question that's really interesting to examine. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about time. We're at time, so okay. we can take one more. One more question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not part of the academy, but I'm a person who reads poetry. My husband is a person who reads Tennant. Mm -hmm. So the analysis of Serena Williams at Indian Wells brought us together in a way that no book of poetry has ever brought us <laughs> together. <laughs> so thank you for that. I actually, uh, I have a friend who is a poet and her brother is a commentator for um, ESPN. And, um, and she said exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, my brother and I. I, <laughs> so I know you're not an activist, but you are moving <laughs> people. I mean, I might direction. be an activist other places <laughs> in my life, but I just, I just wanted to, you know, I, when I sit down to look, I'm not thinking about activism. I'm thinking about making, making. I mean, it's, I think, I, I just think that if you have that other idea, it leads to a tiny, it can lead to a didactic um, stop taking place. So I, I think it's useful to give yourself all the freedom you should be able to have, as much as you can muster, when you sit down to work. You don't have to save the world while you're working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much.